All right, all right, all right. Good morning, Eastern Heights. We're so glad you're here to worship with us today. Would you please stand as we begin our service? We'll start with a call to worship from Luke chapter 1. We are now in the Advent season, as you can tell from our decorations. Thank you for those who helped set up the stage this week. Uh, call to worship from Luke chapter 1. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham, and to his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Amen. Welcome to Eastern Heights. I'm Kimberly Carnes. You see me most often on the keyboard, but I do also help lead the Great Commission team along with Janice Mallory. We're the group that sponsors those Catalyst Rescue Mission meals that you see put out uh, about once every three months where we invite people to contribute some food for that. Um, the Great Commission team is about doing local missions, and we would love your ideas. If you've got an idea for local mission, please get with me or Janice. Uh, we're always looking for fresh ideas, fresh energy. Um, local missions, hands-on opportunities to be the body of Christ here in Jeffersonville. Missions happens around the world, though. There's overseas missions, and our opportunities to actually go are pretty slim. 99% of the time, we are just praying and giving. I shouldn't say just. <laughs> it is our responsibility to pray and to give, and it makes a huge difference because those missionaries who are out there are not out there on their own. They are part of the body. They are the, the hands and feet that are out there, and here we are. We're also part of the body. We're that arm. We're that leg that they're attached to. 
as we pray and give. We're kicking off the Lottie Moon Christmas offerings season um, for international missions starting this week. Um, you will be seeing videos pushed out on Facebook and through the email newsletter. And before the service, we, the last video will be that first Sunday of January when we'll ask for the big missions offering. But you can be praying and asking the Lord all the time between now and then how much you want to give. And you can break it up into to sections if you want to. Um, these, these videos are going to be stories of individual missionaries, so we can pray for them, and we can see where the money that we give goes. It's, you know, when, if we just say pray for the missionaries, it's like, well, Lord, bless them, help them, keep them safe, and um, what, what else do we pray for? I, but when you see the individuals, their ministries, and how God is using them, then you suddenly have many more ideas of how you can specifically pray for them and how they build relationships with the people that, where they can lead them to Christ. And here's the really exciting part. When we get to heaven, which is not that long from now in view of eternity, we're going to get to meet these missionaries and we're going to get to spend eternity with them and with the people who came to the Lord because of their ministry. And we're a part of that. I, I just, the idea of that just makes me so excited. This week, the video that we're going to put out midweek is about Kirsten Lowry and the staff at the Navisha Children's Shelter in Kenya, where they reach out to boys that are living on the streets. So let's open up with prayer for them and for our other missionaries. Take a moment to pray for the boys that they reach out to, that those boys will give their lives to Jesus. As the boys are reconciled to their families, pray that the families will also come to faith. Pray for all of our missionaries, that they will keep their faith strong and their hope in God and their focus on God. Pray for the children of the missionaries, that they will give their lives to Jesus, that they'll be able to make friends in these new cultures, that they'll join in the mission, and that they'll stay healthy. Pray for the missionaries to have safety in traveling, in health, and protection from the enemy. And Father, we just pray for all these ministries that you have going around the world. Give these missionaries wisdom. Help them to be effective. Open doors of opportunity for them and help them as they build relationships with people so that they can share you with them. Father, we thank you. We pray that you would bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kim. Would you all please stand once again as we continue to sing and uh, starting those Advent Christmas songs. So buckle up.
be seated. Please continue to, to worship with us and as we sing Prepare Him Room. Again, meditating on the coming of our Savior. together, God, we look, we look to the heavens and we long for the coming of the Messiah. God, thank you that you did not leave us in darkness, that you fulfill your promises to your people, the words spoken through the prophets long ago, that 
you have come. And we pray, God, in this season that we would set our heart's desires on you and you alone, that you would be the gift that we long for. Thank you, God, for your salvation. We pray now as we turn to your word, help us to believe, help us to receive what you are speaking to us today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are in James chapter 3. We're continuing our look at the book of James. So we invite you to join us there. I want you to imagine, uh, as we're closing in, coming to the end of 2020, imagine that your boss came to see you and said, hey, you know what, despite COVID and everything else, the year's gone well. You've done a really good job. We want to give you $5,000. $5,000. Now, here's the deal. You got $5,000, but you've got to spend it before the month is out. 5000 what would you spend? Just think about that for just a minute. What would, I can think of a number of things I would spend $5,000 on. It'd just be excited about spending $5,000 on. It wouldn't take me much time to spend $5,000. Now, imagine it's the end of the month. You're into the new year. It's 2021. Everything's going to be great now. And they call you in, and the boss says, listen, I made, um, I made a small mistake. It wasn't $5,000. It was... 50. I, I misread the, the decimal point, and there's only it's $50. It's a simple mistake. You can understand that, right? I mean, the decimals, they are tiny. They are hard to see. And he says to you, and listen, we need you to give back all the rest of the money. Uh-oh. Now you're in trouble, because if you spend it like I did, there's no returning anything to get the money back. A little mistake, a little mistake on the part of the boss influenced you to make some life decisions that are having major impacts. We as Christians, as we live out our faith, as we live out our salvation among people, have to realize that often what the world says is something little and insignificant has some major impacts both on our lives and the lives of other people. And so James takes us and makes us look at these things that we could so easily say is not that significant and says, yes, it is very significant and it is having an impact not only in your life, but in the life of those around you. And even more, it's having an impact on your ability to share the gospel. So James starts off in chapter 3, in verse 1, he says, Not many of you should be teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, overall, teaching is important and is essential to being a teacher that you teach the truth. But James is primarily concerned here with those entrusted with teaching the Scriptures. Because those who are teaching the Scriptures are telling those who are not saved how to be saved and are telling those who are saved how to live out that salvation. It has to be done soberly. It has to be done seriously. It has to be done correctly. Because giving mistakes in teaching the Scriptures could tell an unsaved person, give them assurance of a salvation they don't really have, or it can mislead a believer in living a life that doesn't glorify God. And so he says, you've got to be very serious and sober-minded in what you're doing. This is a, a serious task, and for that reason, you are going to be judged. So it's not about you, it's not about your opinions, it's not about your insights, it's about giving glory to God and focusing on him. And we would expect those who teach medicine to teach the truth. We expect those who teach the law to teach the truth. We expect those who teach in education to teach the truth. Well, so much also should we expect those who teach the scriptures. This is not something to be looked at and said, oh, it's just a minor deal. It's not that important. You know, anybody can just go ahead and do it. No, it's got not only impacts to life now, but to impacts to eternity. Now, what's one of the primary ways that we teach? Well, one of the primary ways we teach is by talking. That's the way most teaching occurs overall, and most of the teaching of the Scriptures and preaching and teaching is done in talking, which brings James to his real point. James introduces the teaching to bring you to the point of talking about your tongue. 
talking about your language. Just like a teacher needs to be truthful in what they are sharing so that people will know the truth, those who are unsaved to be saved, those who are saved, how to live out that salvation. So should we all as Christians have our tongues, our language under control. But he starts off and he says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. That's a wonderful statement, but let's be honest. We all struggle in controlling our bodies. We all stumble, including James, the author, is saying that he stumbles. And we all have trouble in controlling our bodies. And one of the areas that we have the the most trouble controlling is our, our tongue, the way we talk. We saw a few weeks back in James, he said, your language can present the gospel as being worthless. Your language and the way you talk, you might talk all about the gospel and know all the Bible verses and all the doctrine, but your language can cause the gospel to appear to be worthless. That's how powerful your your language is. And he says, well, this tongue needs to be under control. Now, he begins to give some examples about the strength of the tongue. He says, we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, and we can turn the whole animal. Now, Horses are big creatures. They're really big. I've I've only ridden like a trail horse, so I don't really know about riding a horse. It's a horse that's gone on the trail so many times, you know, it knows what to do without me. But I I do know that that horse is huge, it's big, it's powerful, and yet they put in its mouth this little metal piece of bit. And you can take a child and give the child the wisdom that they need on how to control that. And they can control this large animal. So a child can direct a horse and where they go. Just that bit and a little bit of wisdom, and that mighty animal is under control. James also goes on, he says, take ships, for example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. This is ancient times, ships have been used to move across bodies of water. They can be fast, they can be slow, they've been used for adventure, they've been used for commerce, they've been used for war. There's all sorts of different shapes and sizes of ships that exist. Today, ships are still the fastest, most effective way of transporting large amounts of things. That's it's still, there's a value in that. But yet with all of that, with the ships and the different designs and all they're doing, they all come down to being guided by a little device called a rudder in the back of the ship. There's a job called a a mariner pilot. And the role of the mariner pilot is to go onto a ship and bring it into port or take it out of port or take it through a canal or a channel. And that individual has to be very trained. You could be the captain of the ship, but when it comes to the port, you let the pilot come on board your ship, and they take over control of the ship to bring it in or to take it through the canal there. And that's, they're trained to do that. But what they're, all, what they're really doing is they're controlling that, that tiny rudder. And so a well-trained pilot can safely guide this large ship. I think maybe when the ship's out on the ocean, you've got some room to move with. But in that case, it has, you've got to know exactly what you're doing. But a well-trained pilot can guide a large ship through this area, through these channels, and bring it to safety. As a matter of fact, the, the ability to control that rudder is the difference between a nice day on the lake and hitting an iceberg. He uses that example, James does, of a bit, and he uses that example of a rudder to take us to a more important issue. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. So he says that tongue, just like the rudder and just like the, uh, the, the bit and the mouth are tiny things, he says, consider the tongue and the power of the tongue and what the tongue can do. As a matter of fact, it, it, it's amazing how that, that tongue can cause some incredible things to occur in our lives. And of course, the emphasis here is not on the tongue itself, not the physical feature, but on the language we use. Think about this. Gentle, encouraging words, when spoken, make you feel good. The person you're sharing them to makes them feel good, and it often motivates people to do good things. It's, it's sort of like uh, some of us have fire pits or we have fireplaces, 
and you, you set up that fire pit and you got it burning or the fireplace and you just sit around that fire. And I don't know about you, but I just, it amazes me to watch the coals burn in that red. And it's just it's very relaxing that goes on. This is how words can be. But words spoken in anger. Words spoken in discouragement. When we speak those words, we don't feel good inside. The person hearing them doesn't feel good. And nobody is motivated to do good by words of anger. You're always motivated to do evil. That's, that's like where the fire gets out of control. When we look on the news out in California, and all those woods that are hundreds of acres, thousands of acres, burned to the grounds, homes destroyed. What? From a spark off a power pole started oh, that damage. He says the tongue is the same way. And the determinants, the difference between that good speech and that bad speech is on the ability to control it. Just like when you can control the flame, it can bring you warmth or cook a meal, that uncontrolled flame destroys without mercy. The same thing's true with the tongue. We've got to be able to control the tongue, just as the rudder controls the ship, the bit controls the horse. Now, to understand the importance of this, James wants you to realize how much you need to understand the tongue. You may look and say, oh, that bit, that's not a big deal on the horse. That's a tiny bit. It's nothing like the saddle. The saddle's big and impressive. Or you may look at the ship and say, the rudder's not that important. It's really the sails that really matter. We want you to understand how important that tongue is. And so he says, the tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets a whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. That's a really harsh description. I mean, we might conclude, you know what? I think it might be better off just not to talk at all. Just keep my mouth shut and not say anything. But God gave us this gift of language. It's a wonderful gift that we have. And so the question is not to quit talking. That's not what James wants you to do. But he wants you to understand the power behind the tongue so you can understand the need for its control. So let's break this verse down a little bit. One of the things he says here about the tongue, he talks about it's a world of evil among the parts of the body. This is a reference that most evil in our life begins with our words. Go back to the story of the Garden of Eden. Everything's good. Everything's very good in the Garden of Eden. And what happens is a serpent shows up. And with words, the serpent challenges God's commands. With words, Eve adds to God's commands. With words, Adam refuses to take responsibility. All of it begins with talking before the sinful act ever occurs. We, we lose people's trust with our words of lying. We use words to talk about somebody before we try to manipulate them. The, the sin, the worst sin mentioned in the Bible is blasphemy, is a sin that is committed with the tongue. If I was to have you make a list of evil sins in the world, you'd probably list off a lot of things that you do with your hands. But he says it's with the tongue that we blaspheme God. And he talks about here how, how this anger, it sets a whole course of your life on fire. See, these words are spoken in anger, they, they damage relationships. They, they hurt your ability to be with other people. And not only does it begin to hurt your relationship with other people, other people don't want to be around you. If your words are going to be hurtful words, if your words are going to be angry words, if they're going to be sharp words that damage, then you will suddenly find that people just start kind of backing off from you. It begins to affect the whole course of your life. Who wants to hire that person? Who wants to be with that person? Who wants to trust that person? And I'm not just talking anger, but they may be scared. I don't want to say anything to them because they're going to turn around and tell somebody else. And gossip with those tongues and those words that we use. So it sets a whole course on fire away from where you, you want to be so that folks say, watch out for that one. They can't control their tongue. 
Should we be surprised then that he says there at the end that these evil words that corrupt our body and send us down this path of destruction are what? Fueled by the fire of hell? Almost like I say, you get to that point, you go, whoa, I didn't really realize my words did that much. I didn't realize my words had that much damage. And that's what James wants you to see because the, what we do tell each other all the time is it's just words. It doesn't matter what we say. I'm just saying words. It doesn't matter how I say them. He says it does. And it's not something we have control over. James goes on, he says, all kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. We've done a great job when it comes to animals. We've got oxen and donkeys that work the farms. We have dogs and cats as we have as pets. We, we've taken reptiles and made medicine from them. We've even genetically changed a mosquito. I don't think that's a good idea in the year 2020 to do, but apparently somebody did, and they've released these genetically mutated mosquitoes. I mean, we, we've got almost all this that we do with nature could get us pretty arrogant. We could start saying, look, we can do this. What can we not do? What can I not control? Look how I've got nature under my thumb. And in doing so, we forget God. We forget that God is creator. And James says, while we have all these animals under control, he says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's this restless evil. It's, it's full of deadly poison. We should not let our arrogance and our accomplishments of what we do blind us to the damage of our tongue. We can't sit there and make a list of all our accomplishments and all our goods and all the wonderful things we accomplish. Do not justify an uncontrolled tongue. But that's what we do. We all the time want to list. But look at the goods that's been done. Look at the wonderful things that are happening. That justifies this uncontrolled tongue. It does not, according to the Scriptures. We might like to try to list it, but it doesn't work that way. He says it is a restless evil. It is full of deadly poison. And you might say, well, Chris, come on. It's not that big a deal. It's not that, what, what you do is more important than what you say. People, people know you're not being serious. People understand it. I was angry. I just said that because I was angry, or I, I just said that because I was disappointed. Come on, come on, it's, it's, not, it's not that big of a deal. And besides, you just said, no, nobody can control the tongue. So let us just say what we want to say. Let's just write what we want to write. Let's just put down what we want to do. Because in the end, what really matters is the accomplishments. James is going to give us three reasons why an uncontrolled tongue is so bad. So the first one he gives is this. He says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. He describes two types of words coming out of the mouth. The first is a curse, and the second is praising God. And he says this ability, this, 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 this ability to say out of the same mouth comes praises and cursings. He says it should not be. This, this cursing and this, this blessing shows a double-minded individual. And you can't exist as a double-minded individual. You're trying to take two opposing ideas and bring them together, and you can't do it. It will drive you crazy trying to take these two opposing ideas and mesh them together. But that is what you are doing. And when you are blessing God in one statement and cursing human beings who are made in God's likeness in the next, you are doing that. You are double-minded in your thinking. As a matter of fact, what you're really doing is attacking God. So you may say, well, now hold on, Chris. People are sinful. and God is holy. And I'm praising God because he's holy, but people are sinful. I, I'm, I'm cursing him. But it says that God makes him in his likeness. And what James is saying there is when we curse people made in God's likeness, what we are doing is we are attacking not them. We are attacking God. You're going up against him. 
Imagine, for example, let's say you uh, were a sculptor and you made a statue or a painter and you painted a picture or, or a gardener and you, you set out a beautiful flower bed and you worked on it and it had the flowers all coming up and they were gorgeous. And I come along with a sledgehammer and I destroy your statue or I rip up your painting or I stomp on your flowers and dig them all up. How would you feel? I think you'd feel upset. You'd feel offended. You'd feel hurt. And I'd say to you, oh, I didn't offend you. I didn't hurt you. I, I hurt the statue. Or I hurt the painting. Or I hurt the flowers. But I didn't hurt you. But you'd say, but I made that statue. I painted that painting. I spent time out here caring for these flowers. Part of who I am is in those things. When you attack those, you are attacking me. God has created each and every one of us. And when we use our words to attack another person, we are, in essence, attacking the master, the creator. We are indirectly speaking against God, and it is a double-mindedness. And it will, if you continue to do it, if you continue to try to praise God and at the same time curse others, you will go crazy. You can't do it. You'll eventually just abandon one of them, which is you'll just abandon praising God and just go straight over to just cursing people. He says not only is an uncontrolled tongue a sign of a double-mindedness that will eventually leave you, lead you away from God, but he says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Well, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm pretty sure that if salt water and fresh water are flowing from the same spring, it's a salt water spring. I mean, as soon as salt water enters it, it makes it salt water. And if I'm thirsty, I'm not going to want to go to a saltwater spring. We hear stories about people who are lost out in the ocean, and there's, you know, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. You all learned that in school. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Water, water everywhere, but still the boards to shrink. Oh, you poor people. Lost at sea, surrounded by water, but you can't drink any of it because it's salt. And if you do, you'll be in worse shape than if you didn't drink any at all. And yet so badly, so dry is your tongue that you want to get satisfied from that. Just, just a little drink of water, just a little bit. But what you need is a fresh spring of water. Fresh water, and fresh water when you, when you drink it, you know, when you've been outside, when you've been hot, when you're worn out and you get a nice drink of clear water. Mm. It just satisfies you. It just meets the desire. But an uncontrolled tongue is undesirable. An uncontrolled tongue offers nothing in the way of satisfaction. It doesn't meet any needs. It leads you wanting and in worse shape than you were in before. So just like you, you want that fresh water to be desirable... So also God has given us language, a controlled tongue, to have something that is desirable to people. But an uncontrolled tongue makes an undesirable person. What, what just, just my language? Yes. Your language makes you undesirable. I'm not saying it's a reason why you may sometimes find yourself alone, but it may possibly be the reason sometimes you find yourself alone. But that tongue is uncontrolled. So there's a double-mindedness there. There's, a, there's a, an undesirableness that comes with it. And one more thing he says there. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. The fig tree produces figs and the olive tree produces olives because it's, it's in their DNA. It's, it's a way they are created. Folks, God created you to have a controlled tongue. That is how you were created. And an uncontrolled tongue is unnatural. 
Now we live in a time in which we call what is unnatural, natural, and what is really natural we call unnatural. We say if everybody's doing it, then that's natural. It's just human nature. But as Christians, we know that it's different. We know if we go back to the very beginning of the Bible, we know that when God created everything and there was no sin, that was natural. That's what it was supposed to be like. And that sin has come in and it has warped everything so that what is natural is now unnatural and what is unnatural is now considered accepted and natural. But we also know that Jesus Christ has come and he died on the cross and been resurrected And he has redeemed us and he is redeeming all of creation. And that we as Christians should be living as if all of this has been corrected. In a world that will call that which is unnatural, natural, we must live differently. In a world that will say an uncontrolled tongue is perfectly acceptable, it's simply words, it doesn't matter what is said or what you write down or what you do. It's, it's all about what you do. We're going to say, no, it's not because words are important and an uncontrolled tongue shows a double-mindedness. It is undesirable and it is unnatural. I mean, how did God create everything? And he said, let there be, he spoke it into being. I'm out of time, so I'm going to have to tell you to come back next week to find out the solution to this problem. That's my way of getting you to come back. But before we go, I want to give you a couple questions to run through your mind on this and to think about. So the first thing I want to ask yourselves, oh wait, what, I go the other direction is better. Do you realize that you have a problem with your tongue? So I already told you everybody does, but surprisingly most of us don't realize that. Do you realize that you have a problem with your tongue? That the curse in one breath and then turn around to praise God is not the way we are created? that it's not the natural order of things, it's not desirable? Are you willing to be honest with yourself and say, hey, I've got a problem with my tongue, with my language? Because if you're not willing to see the problem, you're not going to be willing to let the Lord work on it. The second thing is, do you realize how deadly this language can be, this uncontrolled tongue is? Do you realize that it reflects a double-mindedness, undesirable and unnatural? Do, Do you see that? Are you willing to see that? Are you willing to understand? Because until you understand how serious it is, you're not going to want to do anything about it. So you need to understand how important this is. The third thing is, do you realize you cannot control it on your own? That any solution you come up with, anything you're going to create to control your tongue, you cannot do it on your own. You need to understand that so you can be open to having somebody help you. Who can we go to? We need to look for somebody who has a controlled tongue. We need to look for somebody who was not double-minded. We need to look for somebody who was desirable. Somebody who reflected what everything was supposed to be. And that person is Jesus Christ. See, every word that Jesus said was right. Every word written down about him is desirable. There was no double-mindedness in him. He did what the Father commanded him to do. He lived a sinless life. His actions were pleasing to God. He is not only the agent of creation. It's not only through him that God created everything, but it is through him that the world is being redeemed and made right. 
so if we want to control our tongue, then we need to go to Jesus Christ. And how do we go to him? But by accepting the gift of salvation, by putting our trust in him. So we confess our sins, and one of our sins is, I cannot control my tongue. And then putting our trust in Jesus Christ. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes to abide in us. And the Holy Spirit begins to work in us in controlling our tongue. Which brings me to my fourth thing. Do you realize the Holy Spirit wants to help give you control? Now, if you never accepted Jesus Christ, and you need to do that first so that the Holy Spirit comes to abide in you to help you control your tongue. But if you have, then you need to start being open to how the Holy Spirit wants to work in you. So I want to give you three little activities to try as we finish out. Three little activities to try in allowing the Holy Spirit to control you. The first is this. Fill your words with Scripture. Fill your words with Scripture. I, I don't know how to control my tongue and these words come out. Then read and speak Scripture. You can't go wrong. So fill your words with Scripture. Secondly, learn to ask for forgiveness. Learn to give forgiveness. It's a great use of your tongue. Learn to ask for it and learn to give it. It's powerful what can happen when you start doing that. And third, let praise flow from your lips for God and encouragement to others. Each day, just ask yourself, and then do this, how can I praise God? What is something I can praise God about? And who's somebody I can encourage? There's a good use of your tongue right there. I think that as you begin to allow the Spirit to use you in these ways, as you begin to speak Scripture out loud, as you begin to learn to ask forgiveness and give forgiveness, as you as you learn in that process to praise God and encourage others, you begin to see the Spirit giving you a control over your tongue. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as I preached this morning, I fit in with everybody else in this room struggling with an uncontrolled tongue. I, like everybody else, it is easy for me to say, well, I was angry. Or it's, it's, it's just easy to, to yell and shut people up. I have been as guilty as everybody else in this room of saying hurtful words. Of justifying an uncontrolled tongue. But such things make my faith seem worthless. And I cannot talk to people about the need for you while I'm busy cursing them. So Lord, I pray this morning for those who need to accept you that they will do so. I'm not saying they're not good people. I'm not saying they're not hardworking people. I'm not saying they don't have good intentions. But if they don't have you, if they've not accepted you, then they will be double-minded, undesirable, and unnatural. And I pray for those of us who have accepted you, Lord, to take serious the importance of our language. Take serious the words that we speak and the things that we say. The importance of truthfulness. The importance of love. The importance of praising you. The importance of encouraging others. Let us allow the Spirit to work in us to build up, not to tear down. In your precious name we pray, amen. Our praise team is going to lead us in a time with our voices to praise God. 
I encourage you, if you have any questions about this morning's sermon or issues you're dealing with, there's a perforate sheet on your bulletin. You can fill that out. There's also emails uh, and phone numbers. Please make use of those. We'd be glad to spend some time with you. Amen. Would you please stand as we respond together? Come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of Uh, in your bulletin, there's not a whole lot to mention. Uh, I want to reiterate that, uh, as Kim told us at the beginning, that the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is a great opportunity for you to participate in God's mission to the world. And otherwise, uh, we're continuing to follow CDC guidelines. We thank you all for uh, helping with that. Uh, once we uh, dismiss you, uh, we try to kind of dismiss through the side exit here. So please uh, help us with that. And I know it's freezing outside, but if you can take your conversations outside, that helps us to clear the air as well. All right, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for this opportunity to worship. God, thank you for your word that it is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces uh, divining soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It discerns the hidden things of our hearts. We pray that your word would go with us, that it would bear fruit in our lives, and that we would be commissioned as we go and make disciples of all nations. God, go with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.